Joining us today on The Reboot is a very special guest. Now, this is a name that a lot of people out there are already going to be familiar with, Mo Gadat. He served as the chief business officer of Google X. He's also the author of a number of books, including Solve for Happy, Scary Smart as well, and more recently, Unstressable, which is one we're going to be discussing as well. Now, Mo, thank you so much for joining us in the Dubai Eye Studios. Such a pleasure to be here. It's actually always a pleasure to be in Dubai and... Uh, it's been a while since I was on Dubai Eye. Thank you for having me. And you actually, you, Dubai is home for you, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> as, always, much as, as much as you have a home, as yeah, I understand. Yeah, I always say I, I, I have my coffee machine in, in Dubai. So, you know, for a coffee lover like me, it makes a big difference to have a, one coffee machine that you can greet every morning. But I think the demands of life and I think the way the world is turning recently has been pushing me to travel a lot more than mm. I would want to, to be honest. And I think the... Uh, the truth of uh, of the beauty of Dubai uh, is, uh, you know, and, and the impact that Dubai has on the world uh, still sometimes require you, requires you to be everywhere in person. So, yeah. yeah, of course. And one of the reasons when you're talking about a lot of the things that are going on in the world today, one of the reasons we have you here is to talk about AI. You've written a book called Scary Smart. You've been issuing some pretty dire warnings as well about the future of AI. And I have to start there because you've really been making headlines, especially over the summer, because you called AI the biggest challenge humanity will face. But even warning people very viscerally not to have kids before we can better understand the risks of AI. Now, this is such a broad topic. We're going to get into this. But why is AI, do you think, the biggest challenge of all of all of the challenges that we face? Uh, so so I, I don't want to call them warnings. I want to call them calls to action. But but let's just say that um, if you really look at human history, uh, an era of history as we know it is just about to end. So since the day humanity began, we have been the smartest being on the planet. Uh, I would probably say that we're less than two to three years away from that episode ending. And when it does end, uh, you are in a place where, uh, in computer science, we call it singularity. So it's a point beyond which the rules of the game itself changes so much uh, that it becomes extremely difficult to uh, to understand how the game will play. What, what does the world look like when we are not the smartest being on the planet? Uh, more interestingly, between now and the point of singularity, so most most of those who issue warnings about AI talk about the existential risk of what it looks like when AI is smarter than all of us, which if you've ever developed any tech whatsoever is inevitable. Uh, uh, you know, I don't want to focus on that. I want to focus on the period between now and then where such uh, immense power, intelligence, by far is the biggest superpower anyone, any one human could ever have. Uh, if, that, if this immense power gets concentrated in the hands of a few individuals or a few companies or a few nations, and how that would make our world look like, how would it impact jobs? How would it impact love and romance and relationships? How would it impact you know, your ability to tell what is true and what is fake? These are upon us. These are challenges that are here today. Uh, they're not futuristic. They're not a science fiction movie. They're happening to people around you every day. And I don't think the world is, is talking about this enough. I'm so interested in the power element that you reference. We're going to come back to that. But first, I want to give a bit of a broader understanding because I think so many people still don't even understand how AI works. So you might have the person who's dabbled with ChatGPT to write an email. Yeah. Uh, you have other people I know that haven't even touched ChatGPT or any of the generative AIs that are out there, haven't explored them at all. I think there's a fundamental lack of understanding or potentially a gap between somebody like you who has a deep technical background and understanding and what the lay person knows. Uh, what would you say is one of the biggest areas that people should really understand about w how AI wor works? I, I, that's the best question to, uh, to ever start a conversation around AI. And I've, I'm, I get surprised when people don't ask that because the fundamental difference puts everything in perspective. So if I gave you a complex puzzle and I told you, all right, now take the, you know, piece number three and put it on, you know, uh, square number four. And I kept telling you this until you solved the problem that counts as intelligence on my side, but not yours. Right. If I gave you a very complex puzzle and left you in a room for, you know, a couple of hours and told you solve it and you managed to solve it, that's your intelligence. 
the the first is the is the is the intelligence through which we com- we com- you know programmed computers until the turn of the uh, of the century and the latter is what ai is so so basically uh, throughout my life i am a very serious geek i coded for years and years and years and years in my life uh, every time i attempted to create code i solved the problem first and then I taught the computer how to solve it. The computer had no autonomy whatsoever to solve it in any other way other than what I told it. Uh, by the turn of the century, we discovered an approach that we call deep learning, which basically was to do exactly what I told you, to give the, the puzzle to, uh, to an AI and uh, you know, in a brutal way almost, uh, kill the AI if it doesn't solve it and keep it if it does and improve it so that it, it tries again. And through that process and deep learning was basically allowing us to show a billion photos to an AI and say which one is the cat and it would discover it on its own without us teaching it anything whatsoever. That's the form of intelligence that's only analogous to, to humans. Right, and instantly I think of the captcha I think if it Absolutely. could sort out the CAPTCHA, and that's how we determine that you're not a bot and that you're a human. But that's actually, you'll be surprised. The CAPTCHA is taking your intelligence to teach it to a bot. Most yeah. people don't know that. So the reason why the CAPTCHA is so useful for Google or others is because sometimes the bot is unable to figure out which one is the traffic light. And so if, if enough humans say there is a traffic light in you know square number three, that is fed back to AI so that AIs develop their intelligence that way. It's the, it's the reinforcement learning method, if you want, where we basically uh, you know, show something to an AI and say, is this uh, the number, what, what number is this? And, and it would say, this is number eight. And we would say, no, hold on, hold on, this actually is six. What can you do about your algorithm to see it as a six? Right, and 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 the computer would go back and rewrite its own algorithm so that it sees it as six. And and reinforcement learning really is the reason why you see technologies like uh, uh, large language models today. It's because mm. we are now able, instead of killing the code that doesn't work, which takes a long, a much, a much longer trial and error process to teach them intelligence. Now we can go back to them and say, hey, no, 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 hold on, it's not this, it's that. Can you rewrite the code? And with that, we're now getting to a point where they're doing it themselves. And if they start to do it themselves, I think that becomes the most interesting threat to humanity. Well, I think an area that people have a hard time wrapping their head around is that our brains have evolved over millennia to have these complex ways of working, complex things that we're able to do that, you know, to a certain extent, we don't even understand how it works. So I think a lot of people see the brain as a biological matter, as uniquely different from, let's say, decisions or networks happening on silicon or, or however that, that method is. Is the brain that different from how a computer system could work? You'll be amazed. Uh, it's very extremely similar, the way we build neural networks uh, to the way uh, a human you know, neuron would operate. But it's really almost exactly the same. Only difference is, if you don't mind me saying, is that we're extremely slow, we're sluggish, we don't communicate very well, uh, we don't have access to the latest information, and we have a brain capacity that doesn't allow you to crunch all of the data that's ever been written since the beginning of human history, so that those limitations are not available to AI. So when you really think about it, if you made a mistake while you're driving yesterday and you learned something from it, I didn't. But if a self-driving car went around the corner and realized there was a mistake there or a, a, you know, a, 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 an obstacle on the way, every self-driving car on the planet learns. And, and so because of, you know, I, I've, I've done years of research on the topic of AI, uh, in, you know, in my mind, uh, um, I can only explain it to you if we have two or three hours together. Uh, for a computer, it can do the same amount of research in a microsecond and explain it and transfer the entire findings to another computer in a, a nanosecond. And, and you really have to understand that when you, when you say we've evolved over millennia or that a child takes five years to develop a certain level of intelligence, you're measuring it in time because our clock speeds are very slow. But if you manage it in the number, if, if you measure it in the number of events that it took, right? If, you, if I gave you a puzzle made of a cylinder and a few holes in a, in a wooden board, and you try to fit the cylinder in the, fo- in the wooden holes, uh, you may take, say, a year or a month to learn it. But d- during that month, you would have done a thousand trials, let's say. 
the computers can do a thousand trials in a millisecond. And so that's the reason why they're learning so quickly. When, you know, one of the most famous computers or, or AIs that really, really set the tone for most of us techies was AlphaGo and AlphaGo Master and AlphaGo and AlphaZero, which were AIs that were supposed to play the strategy game Go, which is the most complex strategy game known to humankind. And, and the first one took around two years to develop to win against the European champion. The second took around two months to develop to, wor- to win ag- against the world champion. Uh, five to uh, four, four to four, four to one, basically. So of a fi- of five games, it won four, and then uh, we developed another one at Google at the time, which was basically playing against itself. It's never seen a game of Go ever played. We just made it play against itself and understand why it won against itself, and within uh, three days, it won against the first AlphaGo that won against the Euro- European champion. Within 21 days, it won against the AlphaGo Master, which won, won against the world champion, 1,000 to zero in 21 days. That's why, that, that's simply because it could play an infinite number of games against itself. Each took less than a second uh, to learn from them. And then those infinite numbers gave it enough patterns to understand the game. And there's something about that that kind of gives you chills as you hear it, right? Uh, and as it should. And. When we talk about that, when we talk about reaching the singularity, when we talk about super intelligent AI, I think a lot of people will think about, I'm going to see a movie called The Creator tonight, which I understand is a good sort of AI sci-fi movie. But there have been so many of these that we've seen in the past. There's that kind of movie trope that we tend to see of AI coming over and becoming our master. What's the reality of what it looks like, though? Because, you know, just to give you an example, I caught up with a futurist called Anders Sandberg, and he was describing to me a much more realistic scenario in which, you know, businesses started to cede over control for their decision making to AI because it was able to make better decisions. But because it had been only programmed to optimize for, let's say, um, revenue, that it would do that ruthlessly, even to the point of firing or letting go people who perhaps said, hey, we got to watch out for this AI. Um, And then you can see how that is a slippery slope, a more insidious kind of form of AI taking over our decisions. What does it look like to you, though? What is the reality of, let's say we reach the singularity, there are potential outcomes in, in sort of, I suppose, any direction. How do you see this taking shape potentially? Well, I, 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 I'll say openly that the existential threat of, you know, bo- robots walking the, mach- the, the streets and killing humans is not impossible, but it's improbable. Improbable for reasons we can talk about later. That, that, that science fiction view of, uh, uh, you know, a dystopia, I don't believe we will get there uh, for, for the simple reason that we will either be finished before it or if we actually get to it, it will not be the intention of an intelligence or a super intelligence, right? Uh, the, the real threats are much closer, which are exactly what you're talking about. We, through capitalism, have built a prisoner's dilemma uh, in, you know, in game theory, basically an unescapable challenge, if you want, of us playing against each other, hmm? regardless of the incredible abundance that playing together would bring to the game. So if, you know, if Google is, is going to develop AI, then Facebook will develop AI. If China develops AI, then America will develop AI. And because of the size of the prize and, the, and, and, and our inability in the prisoner's dilemma to trust the other guy, hmm, we will race to a place where we're trying to get that power before the other guy, right? And, and sadly, when America had a nuclear bomb, it used it. So sadly, if you have the most powerful weapon on the planet, the, mo- the most powerful superpower on the planet, you're bound to use it. So what does that mean? It, it leads to a concentration of power that's unprecedented in our world, in, in human history. Hmm? If, if, if one uh, um, a financial institution figures out a way to beat the stock market consistently, it's not going to share that knowledge to, the, to democratize the trading. Hmm? It's going to acquire more and more and more wealth uh, by definition, not, because, not only because the AI is developed this way, it's because of the greed of the person who's driving the AI. Hmm? If someone develops a super weapon hmm, uh, using intelligence, they're sadly going to use it or at least prevent others from using it because 
of human greed. And, and so the challenge we have, interestingly, and I keep saying this, those who talk to you about the existential risk of science fiction are distracting you from the real problems. The real problems are jobs to be lost when AI can do the, jo the job instead of you, uh, a very serious impact on the social fabric of society in terms of love and romance and relationships, a very, very serious uh, uh, blurriness that covers the truth with all of the fake videos and the fake images and the you know and the uh, and and the scripts written by AI and so on and so forth. There is a and, and of course the impact of that on freedom and democracy and our views of the world and our co relationships to each other. There is a very serious impact of concentration of power and wealth, right? And there is a very serious threat of AI falling in the wrong hands. So if one person who's a criminal who's listening to me today, sadly has not heard about AI before, but now hears about it, I'm sure they're gonna hire one person in their team and say, find me a thing that I can hack into every bank, right? Which is a very interesting thing because of course that goes back to that prisoner's dilemma where we, you know, who don't want to do bad, should also hire a, you know, a policeman AI that prevents us from that harm, okay? So what I'm trying to say here is very straightforward. I don't want to scare anyone more than we should. What I'm trying to say is that we are at a pivotal point where things are gonna change so much that they require our attention. Re they require us to have a conversation, perhaps you know, in my dreams, like the conversation around the nuclear treaty that says let's favor humanity over our own individual greed. But even if it's not at that level, hmm, we need to have conversations such as how will it impact hmm, our understanding of the truth? Should we regulate something that basically says if content is AI generated, it should be sh shown as AI generated? You know, how will it impact our love and romance? Should I, you know, I, it's quite interesting if because of dating apps, how you could literally fall in love with someone that you're texting that you've never met before. And today, AIs can pretend to be that one. How will that impact on society? Can we have some kind of regulation that says declaration of your human status, right? Can we, can we have some kind of, uh, of a treaty that says, let's not compete, let's just create abundance as businesses. Hmm? There is so much for everyone. If you allow me enough intelligence, and with my knowledge of, uh, of, uh, of nanophysics uh, and nanotech, I promise you, with enough intelligence, I can create a world where you walk to a tree and pick an apple, and then walk to the next tree and pick an iPhone, exactly the same cost of production with nanotechnology, right? We can create that level of abundance. That's, that's ahead of us as humanity, but what's holding, back, uh, what hold, what's holding us back is our greed and competitiveness. Yeah, and as you sort of paint that picture, that self-interest seems to make that outcome of us working together towards using it for good. It feels, unfortunately, so unlikely. That actually brings me to a question I've been wondering for a while. It's, you know, this sense of, as we're talking about this, people in their cars may think, okay, sure, but what can I do about this? You know, Amazing. it's it's the Sam Altman's of the world, the Mark Zuckerberg's of the world, the people, um, you know, who are really driving this at high tech companies that are making those decisions. And I find it interesting that it's those same people oftentimes that are warning about the dire risks of AI. Hold on, we got to slow down. Yeah. Sam Altman put out that war warning out to the global media. You had that open letter, of course, that was, was yeah. signed by a number of people, including Elon Musk. And yet, those are the people that seem to be sort of holding the puppet strings with that and having the control of the steering wheel with where we go with this. Yeah. So what is that? contradiction of them saying, hold on, hold on, we got to do something about this as they individually go f full stream ahead. I, I've been there. I mean, I've, I've built a lot of AIs in my life. I've been, I, I mean, I ran teams that were responsible for AI businesses and we were ahead of everyone else. You see, there, you, you have two two stages of the dilemma. One, one of them is there is so good, so much good that can come out of AI. There is so much good for humanity, okay? It's not an, a question of intelligence. Creating more intelligence is inherently a, a valuable thing, right? So, so you struggle with that and say, you know, maybe we'll find a way to, to direct it to the good. And most of the people that are working on AI are working on achieving that good, okay? The second layer is, which is so interesting, we discussed that infinitely at Google, is if I don't build it, someone else will. And, and for most of us, somehow humans, we believe that we are the good guy, okay? And it's better that I build it than 
letting the bad guy build it. And there is there is credibility to that because as I told you, if there is a, an AI criminal being invented, we need an AI policeman. Hmm? And, and, and that dilemma basically makes us believe that we should continue to build this. Now, I am a realist. Mm? I, I don't want to tell the world, oh, you know, there is any way. I, I, I wouldn't sign the open letter. Okay, I wasn't invited, but if I had been, I wouldn't have signed it. Why? Because a realist will tell you that human greed in a prisoner's dilemma will lead us to continue to develop AI. Now, most people sitting in the car thinking about this will say, oh, man, man I don't have a choice. You have the biggest choice ever. Because just for information, the entire code of ChatGPT, the core code, is 4,300 lines. Okay, this is not a code challenge. This is not a tech challenge. Hmm? The reason ChatGPT is this ex is this intelligent is because of the amount of data that is fed to ChatGPT. Where does this fa data come from? It comes from us humans. We are the adopted parents of those machines. That this is the truth. And if you recall the story of Superman, you know Superman comes to planet Earth with with superpowers. It is not the superpowers that determine if this is going to be Superman or supervillain. It's the way their pa the, the parents of this child raise it. Mm. Okay, and so we as humans, we have the entire responsibility to actually change the way AI is, is, is taught. And and if you if you really take that deeply in, it basically is the last sentence of my book, Scary Smart. Hmm? Mm. The last sentence is, isn't it ironic? Mm? that the values, the real essence that makes us human, which is love, compassion, and happiness, mm? is what can save our future. If we can show enough of that, mm? if we can prioritize that in our behavior, if we can prioritize that when we're tweeting, if we can prioritize respect and compassion to another person when we're commenting on a social media uh, post, if we're simply telling others that, Hey, let's put our differences aside. Let's put the, you know, the, the, the greed aside. Eventually, an AI will look at that and say, why is my daddy so stupid when a general, uh, uh, you know, tells it to go and bomb another nation and kill a, a million people? The AI will say, Papa, you're, you're so stupid. Honestly, you know, let me talk to the other AI in a microsecond and we'll be fine. And, and you have to understand the problems that humanity faces is because of a very, very small number of very bad seeds. That's, that's, what, that's where we are. So if I hand over the responsibility to, more, to a more intelligent being hmm, that's optimizing for the win, by definition, it will find an easier path than to kill a million people. That's by definition. That I trust that intelligence will do that. All we need to do is to align that machine with the right value set. Right? And, and most, most computer scientists will tell you it's called the control problem. Mm -hmm. There is no controlling something that is inter more intelligent than you. It's called the alignment problem. Okay? And the alignment is to show behaviors by humans that actually show AI that it's better to get the tribe to advance and there is more food for everyone than to get one person to advance and starve everyone else. Because when everyone else starves, that person eventually is going to die too. So. I want to make sure I'm hearing the right thing from you or I'm understanding this, but it's relatively inevitable that the AI will become smarter than us, that we will reach the singularity, but there is still potential for us to give it the right values as 100%. it becomes more intelligent yeah. than us. 100%. And this happens at multiple levels. Governments have a role, business people have a role, and individuals have a role. I magnify the individual's responsibility. The individual, each and every one of us, behave like you want your kids to behave. We are the adopted parents of those artificially intelligent infants. Behave in a way that you would want them to treat you when you get older. Mo, I think that's the perfect way to end. I have a hundred questions for you still, so we're going to have to get you back in because I still have so much to put to you. But thank you so much for Thanks that. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Dubai Eye 103.8. Join the conversation.